Okay, okay. Yeah, sorry about my PowerPoint difficulties. But yeah, I'm very excited to host this webinar today. Thanks everyone for joining. Uh, VIAs are always uh, an important topic and it's never ending um, for many reasons. I think people get better at their designs by incorporating more aspects into their VIA designs. Um, and it's just a never ending learning process. Uh, and we, so in this webinar, we will talk about the basics as well as some more, a little bit more advanced techniques like etch back and do some demos of our uh, impedance tools and our, our you know, via, via tools that we have. So we have a, a lot of good things to talk about today. So of course, VIA's, oh, oh, sorry, one thing about Sierra, if you don't work with Sierra already, I encourage you to do so. Um, you know, it will fund the webinars and, uh, you know, but in all honesty, uh, Sierra has been growing every year and we thank you for your support. And if you haven't worked with us, please uh, check us out, ask for a price quote. We, one thing new about Sierra is that we have a production facility now in Wisconsin. So we're able to uh, move larger volume orders to a lower cost region with the same uh, quality. So that's a really exciting thing. Uh, for us to offer our customers. So this is like the agenda for today. Uh, we're really going to go through um, some of the basics, uh, important things, all relating to, to VIAs and the quality and the reliability of VIAs. So why do VIAs matter? Well, so VIAs connect all your nets and when a via fails uh you know basically your board doesn't work even if it's one via so that uh i think is enough said on that to be honest but you can have all sorts of electrical issues with inappropriately designed vias um getting you know signal reflections and you can have issues with you know reliability overheating uh, and then, as you guys mentioned, uh, having, uh, you know, really controlling your electrical properties or your impedances are important. So this is just a general slide. Uh, I don't recommend having every via structure in one circuit board, but this just illustrates the different types of via structures. So a through hole, of course, blind vias from one to two or from one to three is possible. Buried vias, you can't see them from the outside. They're inside your board which means there are gonna be multiple laminations and then stack vias or staggered vias. Staggered vias are more reliable um, and, but stack vias, you know, in consumer are, is definitely okay as well. So calculating your pad size uh, is pretty straightforward. Uh, however, I'd like to say you should really consider what are the tolerances of the fab shop that you're using. And if you don't know which fab shop you're using, then how do you know what design, you know, whether you design something that is good for them? Uh, every fab shop has different tolerances um, it, when it comes to this, because all the tolerances really come together here. Uh, not just mechanical drill or laser drill machine tolerances, but material movement as well. Uh, and how accurately all of those are controlled. And so it seems straightforward, but it, it actually incorporates a lot of things. So you always wanna make sure you have sufficient pad dimensions. So what what is the minimum pad you can design with? And you have to think about your applications and what kind of, hole it is, if it's a component hole, that's different and has, you should have larger vias and larger pads versus if it's just a micro via, through hole micro via for connection purpose. And then if it's a through hole micro via for space or aerospace or military application that has more spacing requirements, a bigger pad and a bigger angular ring requirement than if it's class two. So if if you're if it's a class two automotive and you want to follow guidelines for reliability for there, you shouldn't go with the minimum that your board fabricator can do. You should go with the most reliable uh, for your end application. 
But the idea is the same that, you know, we're going to have a finished hole size. It's going to, which is drilled plus plating. So we drill bigger than the hole size you specify, because that's what you specify. Most fabricators take that as a finished hole size. So we'll drill a little bit bigger and we'll plate in the hole, plate in the via. Before we plate, we clean the via and also perform any etch back requirements, which we'll talk about later. And we also, and then after that all is done, that is your finished annular ring. And you have to take into account the tolerances that I was mentioning. And some of the, some of those are listed in the IPC spec. But really, I would talk to your fabricator. I think the IPC spec is a little outdated at this point. So for class two, class three, your annular ring requirements are different. Uh, and for because you know the final spec calls for some a, a, a different uh, number that we have to meet. It's a different requirement. So for class three, you always want larger pad sizes or larger annular rings versus class two. And it's also different for mechanical vias versus laser drill micro vias. And at the end of the day, a laser drill micro via, let's say on the outer layer, most probably will get filled. So the annular ring is a little bit less important on a micro via, laser drilled micro via than it is on a mechanical through hole via. Aspect ratio plays a very important role on reliability. You know, your aspect ratio um, is, if it's not within the right range, then you're gonna have a problem with uh, plating. And, the, you know, if you don't have proper plating, that's where the issues start. So you don't want any um, cracks or, you know, I mean, there's all sorts of quality defects and holes, but you don't want any voiding and you want, especially in laser drills, you want to possibly penetrate the copper layer below if um, if that if that's possible in your design. And then uh, our copper fill plate tanks will plate from the bottom up to make sure there's a good connection there at the bottom of the laser drill via. So here, uh, you know, the minimum plating thickness for class two is eight tenths, for class three it's one. So we tend to plate a little bit more than the minimum. And this, this chart goes through how to calculate your aspect ratio. So why do we prefer laser drilling for microvias? Um, Laser drilling provides, you know, more precise accuracy in terms of true position of the drill, um, you know, and and you can really get a smaller uh, final drill. So a two and a half to three mil via is possible in thin dielectric and flat glass type of a reinforcement, uh, and then even smaller, but that you'd have to talk to us. Uh, and then that's more of like on the micro electronic side. But uh, what you see in the picture depicts how a micro via is actually formed. And you know, to, the reason why you can't laser drill through your complete board is because lasers cause heat. And then the heat, you know, when it's melting the dielectric, it becomes very hard for good adhesion of the copper. So that's an important uh, thing to know. That's why you know, you pick up to pick the right glass cloth and you have to understand, you know, how does your via look after laser drilling prior to plating and a cross section can tell you all these things. But lasering uh, from more than one layer to the next is really not advisable. So why should you calculate the current in via? So insufficient current flow through the vias will interrupt the connection between the adjacent layers of the board. And if the vias are not designed with the current rating in consideration, they can overheat, uh, potentially damaging components and traces and just the overall reliability and integrity of the board. 
And overheated uh, vias can result in electrical issues such as increased resistance, of course, and um, voltage issues, voltage drops. Very often you can, I see customers tenting their vias, which is absolutely okay. Uh, via tenting is a process of covering over any, you know, kind of exposed copper or just covering the via in general. It protects the via from corrosion as well. Uh, some people use it for, you know, like a vacuum environment. Um, and I would say before you decide to tent your vias, um, really talk to your fabricator and what their design rules are for tenting. Uh, if the via is too big, tenting becomes problematic. Uh, and uh, you then kind of have to fill the via with a little bit of solder mask and then tent over it, which uh, you know requires more time. And um, you need to make sure the design fits that process. So uh, talk to your fabricator on the via tenting uh, design rules. There's uh, conductive and non-conductive via filling. So conductive via filling um, can be done in many ways. Usually we see silver epoxy and, um, you know, really there's a non-conductive via fill as well, which is the more preferred method. Uh, so via filling is very important for assembly as well. Uh, oops. Like just, this is a kind of a quick snapshot of our via filling uh, process. It's a vertical machine and we put the panel up there and then basically the paste gets uh, pushed into the via. So the aspect ratio of your via fill process is important as well when you're designing your, your via structure. It's not the same um, as with in a thin board versus a thick board. So again, talk to your fabricator to know what the design rules are for filling the via, what the aspect ratio needs to be. So uh, we have a via current carrying uh, capacity and temperature rise calculator, which I think the engineering team will do a demo of. Thank you, sir. The via current capacity and temperature rise calculator uh, is based on the trace current capacity formulas given in IPC 2152 standard. The default units of all the parameters are present on the right of the parameter fields. Uh, you can change the units for these parameters independently using the drop down for each fields. Uh, likewise, you can select different units uh, for via current, resistance, voltage drop, and the power loss. To use the calculator, uh, let us start by entering the ambient temperature of 30 degrees Celsius. Uh, we are plating thickness of one ounce. We are height of 63 mils. A temperature rise above ambient 40 degrees Celsius and maximum via current capacity 4 amperes. Uh, to calculate the via drill diameter, click on calculate next to the parameter. The value calculated for the via drill diameter is 15.1 mils. Uh, the resistance at ambient temperature, resistance at high temperature, the voltage drop at maximum via current capacity, and the power loss at maximum via current is also calculated. Uh, let us look at another scenario uh, where we know the via diameter and the temperature rise, and we wish to know the via current capacity. Uh, hence, add the temperature rise above ambient, and let us change this via drill diameter to 10 minutes. Click on calculate here. And the maximum via current capacity here now is 3 amperes. Uh, likewise, if we know the via diameter and the current capacity, we can calculate the temperature rise. You can click on this help content to know more about the parameter. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Vandana. Go back to my presentation. So how does via impedance impact signal integrity? If the via impedance does not match the transmission line impedance, the signals passing through the via may reflect back. 
So the magnitude of this reflection depends on the difference between the impedance of the trace and the impedance of the via at the transition point. So to reduce impedance discontinuity, implement a coaxial via structure where the signal pad at the center is surrounded by multiple ground vias. And then of course, try our via impedance calculator to render accurate via capacitance, inductance, and impedance using its physical dimensions. So a via, and manage your via stubs to avoid signal attenuation as well. So a via stub is an inactive portion of a via uh, that forms a resonant circuit with a specific frequency. So when a signal operates at that at this frequency or at its odd harmonics, it can cause uh, the signal attenuation. So to avoid this, make sure the signal's maximum frequency is significantly lower than the stub resonant frequency. And you can always adapt a uh, back drilling to eliminate the, the via stubs. So going through some DFM tips for back drilling. So back drill diameter should be slightly larger than the primary drill diameter. And so the diameter is usually eight mils over the primary drill size uh, with a three mil tolerance. So provide a minimum 10 mil trace and plane clearance uh, from the back drill. Don't forget that. And then a maximum of 10 mil stub length can be retained after the back drill without significantly affecting signal integrity. But uh, really we can get very accurate with the back drills now. Um, they can stop within one mil of the copper layer without penetrating the copper layer. Uh, so you can uh, you can get based on your your layout, you can get specific uh, design rules from us. I think Vandana is going to demo this. Uh, the maximum via stub length calculator helps to determine the optimum stub length and its resonant frequency. At resonant frequency, a via stub functions as a resonant circuit and can store maximum energy. Hence, the length of a via stub should be within an acceptable range to avoid signal integrity issues. Uh, to calculate the maximum via stub, you need to enter the dielectric constant and any one among the maximum data transfer rate, faster signal rise time, maximum frequency content, or the uh, 3 dB bandwidth. Uh, you can choose the input parameter you wish to enter by selecting the checkbox right next to the desired. Let us assume a dielectric constant 4 and a maximum frequency content 20 gigahertz. Click on calculate stub length. Uh, we can see that the maximum via stub length, resonant frequency, the maximum data transfer rate, faster signal rise time and the 3 dB bandwidth are calculated here. The tool also allows reverse calculation where you can enter the dielectric constant and the maximum stub length to calculate the remaining parameters. Let us change this to 0 0.005 inches and click on calculate here. So the other parameters here are calculated and displayed. Uh, you can select different units for each of these uh, uh, parameters by clicking on the drop down here. So as observed at higher frequency, for example, the 20 gigahertz, uh, the VR stubs are smaller and can cause serious signal integrity issues. Since the micro VR do not have a stub, the VR stub issues can be avoided by using laser micro VRs. Thank you very much. You can get back to the slides now. Okay, thanks, Pamela. So next topic is how to arrange the thermal vias for heat dissipation. So thermal via is a through hole contact with the copper layer for enhanced thickness. These vias are filled with conductive epoxy resin usually and covered with copper. And you can place the vias near the heat source to lower the thermal resistance and increase, and increase the heat dissipation rate. So you, thermal vias uh, directly under the thermal solder pad of the circuit can be there with 0.7 mm thickness. And for optimal uh, thermal conductivity, offer a diameter of 0.3 mm and a via to via distance of 0.8 mm. And back to you, Ramana.
So Sierra circuits presents the via thermal resistance calculator that helps you to calculate the number of thermal vias that can be placed on a thermal pipe uh, in two types of via patterns and calculates the thermal resistance for a single via and the total number of vias. It also allows you to optimize the drill diameter or the via to via spacing for a given number of thermal vias. Uh, to use the calculator, we start by selecting the desired unit system available in the drop down. Let's go with inches for now. Selecting the via pattern shows the image of the via arrangement. Enter the inputs. Let's go with length as 0 0.393 inches. Same for the width of the thermal pad. Let's take a 0.2 watt per inch Kelvin as the thermal conductivity of the filler, via filler. Uh, 0 0.062 inches as the via height. Plating thickness 0 0.0037. Drill diameter is 0 0.0158 and via to via spacing of 0 0.031 inches. Click on calculate here against the number of thermal vias. So we can see that for this particular arrangement, a total number of 81 thermal vias have been calculated and the thermal resistance of the signal via and the total number of vias are displayed here. Uh, you can also calculate the drill diameter if the via to via spacing and the number of thermal vias is known. Likewise, you can calculate the via to via spacing if the drill diameter and the number of thermal vias is entered. Uh, click on the thermal conductivities of filler materials here for a list of all the filler materials along with their thermal conductivities, glass trans uh, transition temperature, and coefficient of thermal expansion. Thank you, sir. Over to you. Okay, thanks. Uh, so one conversation um, that looks like people wanted to hear more about is edge back. Uh, so within spec, uh, there is a converse, uh, it is specified as pot, there is positive edge back, but so basically edge back removes the epoxy resin from the sides of a drilled hole wall to ensure a strong three point connection um, within the inner layers of the board. So in that diagram, you can see the inner layer protruding a little bit out. And then you, when you plate, you're plating around the three sides. So positive etch back is re recommended for class three and it's in the spec. And it's usually uh, two tenths of a mil. Uh, and then negative etch back selects selectively etches the undesired copper to prevent short circuits and is allowed up to one tenth of a mil. So if you want a, if you're not, uh, let's say aerospace, you probably don't need an etch, uh, positive edge back requirement. But if you are very concerned about the reliability of your board, um, then an etch back requirement is recommended. And uh, positive edge back has a number that we have to meet, and whereas negative edge back or no negative edge back, it, there's no number that needs to be met. So that's an important distinction uh, that you, you need to uh, be aware of. So what you put on your fab drawing will determine how we behave as a fabricator here. I hope that helps clear up some confusion around edge back. Uh, I think the remaining part of the presentation is really about uh, routing techniques and what kind of via structures to use and how to do that uh, as well within Altium. Uh, so V in pad routing um, is important. Their vias in pads are placed directly under the solder pad where the you know BGA balls are are attached. Um, Again, we will drill the vias, we'll plate the vias, and then we'll fill the vias. And these vias are done at a different time than the other vias, other through hole plated vias. So V and pad does cost more and takes more time uh, because it goes through drilling separately uh, and it goes through that process of via filling where I showed some equipment. Uh, so there's two uh, V and pad routing techniques. 
Uh, first is the offset center. Uh, and then the second is the partial uh, VN pad. When you're talking about tight boards, it's important to know, are you gonna go with a solder mask, non-solder mask defined or solder mask defined? Uh, so there are uh, trade-offs. Uh, and, you know, I would say advantages of each, but that's an important discussion with your fabricator. Uh, what tolerances can you, can the fabricator hold? Um, you know, how tight can their uh, solder mask webs be? Um, what kind of openings, how small can their openings be in solder mask? So these, all these discussions need to happen with the fabricator for you specifically for your design. We also have a routing technique as dog boning. That's fairly common. Uh, and it also affects your mask. So knowing what kind of breakout you're doing will affect your uh, mask layer. So the dog bone fan out for a 0.5 or a one millimeter pitch BGA is represented here. Uh, we're defining the air gap and, uh, you know, how big of a channel you can have and, you know, how, how, what's the minimum spacing at that point as well. So you can do dog bone with 0.5 millimeter pitch BGA. I think this is a rhetorical question, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, here are some really important under, you know, clearances that you really need to understand. So, and again, if you're class two versus class three, all these things play a role in the in the clearances that you should have in your board. Uh, my personal favorite is drill the copper because that's pretty much a, a no go if you do something less than eight. Probably a lot of the fabricators around the world will start having problems being able to manufacture that. If you keep it to eight, you're you're probably okay. Um, knowing how close you can be, have copper to the edge of the board. Uh, we, we prefer 10, but you can definitely get smaller. It's just, you, again, you have to talk to us. It's going to be outside of standard. So uh, here, so finished hole to copper uh, is basically the drill to copper clearance plus the plating thickness times two. So if the drill to copper is eight and the plating thickness is one, then the finished hole to copper clearance is eight plus two, which is 10. And drill to copper is really the edge of the drilled hole wall. You can uh, hear some kind of expert guidelines, but uh, you know, take everything with a grain of salt as per your design. Uh, in terms of specifying the tolerance of your vias, um, I always encourage customers to say something like plus zero minus some big number because that tells us that you know we we nothing's really going into the hole it's just a micro via and then we can balance the overall trade-offs in our process uh, flows in our manufacturing but that gives your gives the manufacturer the biggest uh, leeway but still gets you what you want.
how do you know you have a good board at the end of the day? Uh, the fabricator that you use should present a cross section and the cross section will show edge back. Uh, if you ask for that positive edge back, it'll show um, wrap at the knee of the hole. It'll show proper uniform plating within the hole. Uh, if you don't have, uh, if your fabricator doesn't have proper plating tanks, you'll see all sorts of problems and they'll show up in the cross section, um, including uh, delaminations and things like that. So cross section is super important um, to make sure that you have a reliable board that will last in the field. So I think uh, next we have basically a demo in the design tool that will go over these items, um, routing guidelines and things like that. So our design team is up next. Hello, uh, thank you, sir. Uh, so today uh, we'll see uh, how to use wires in LTM designer. Uh, so before using them, we need to define different types of wire that will be used in the design. So uh, to do that, uh, you, need to, you need to go to design and you need to click on layer stack manager. So I've already opened it. So you will see something like this. It's nothing but uh, the stack up structure of the PCB. Uh, it consists of 12 layers and the board thickness is around uh, 62 mils. So down here, there is option called as wire types. So as you can see on the right hand side, there are different types of wires. So through hole wires, blind and buried wires, which are selected. If you want to add something, you have to click on this add wire type and you have to select from this properties panel, the start layer and the stop layer. So that's how you add the wire. So I'll remove it for now. And then you have to say, uh, right click and save. So I'm not saving it because it's already saved for me. Okay, so once you have uh, defined the wires, the next thing is to create the rules. So you need to go to design and rules. So there are uh, three important rules. That is one is the clearance. Uh, next one is the width and third one is the wires. That is routing wire style. So we'll see the routing wire style. So we have created this normal wire rule, uh, which will be applicable for all the normal signals. And we have used a, a pad size of 18 mils uh, and a hole size of eight mils. So this will be decided by your aspect ratio. Um, of the true wire. Then we have BJ1. So BJ1 of 1 mm. So we have created a room of BJ1. So as you can see on the left hand side, this is the uh, BJ room. So uh, here also we are using 80 mil pad and 8 mil hole set because this is a 1 mm pitch BJ and it can be easily fanned out through dog bone structure with the help of normal true wire. Then we have BJ2, wherein we have a defined uh, uh, wire size of 10 mil. Uh, 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 pad size and four mil hole size. That's because we'll be using uh, micro wires in this region because four mil is possible only with the micro wire. So uh, through wire will not go below uh, six mil. So this is the rule for the micro wire, wherein uh, it will be used for 0.4 mm pitch BGA and uh, 0.5 mm pitch BGA. And then we have created one more rule for power. So we have created a net class and uh, named as power. This can be created through design uh, classes. And here we are using a pad size of 20 mils and a hole size of 10 mils. So these are the, these are few important uh, wire rules that you have to create before you start designing your PCB. So once you are done with this, just say okay. Now, before fanning out any BGA, so it is very important to place the BGA as per the grid. Okay. So for example, this BGA has a pitch of as a pitch of one mm. As you can see, thirty nine point three seven. You need to make the grid half of this. So half of that would be 19.685. If I make the grid, half of that, as you can see. Um, I think we cannot hear you properly. Can you fix your mic? Yeah. Uh, yeah, better, thanks. Yeah, uh, as you can see, each ball of the uh, BGA is falling on each grid dot. So which will be very helpful while placing the wires because if I place a wire over here, It, it, it falls exactly at the center of the pads, as you can see, and the clearance from all the pads will be similar. So this is a 18 mil uh, uh, diameter and 8 mil uh, hole size wire. 
So similarly, uh, while routing also it will be helpful for you. I would recommend instead of uh, dividing the pitch by two, divide it by four while routing. That will be helpful for you because you will get one more dot in between, which will help you in routing better way. So that is why uh, setting the grid uh, before placing the uh, BJ is very important. So the next thing is how to fan out this uh, BJ. Uh, there's an option for auto fan out in LTM. So you have to select the component. Then right click, click on component action and there's option fan out component. Click on that. You can select, uh, uh, we don't want to fan out which doesn't have nets. Then then out, uh, if you want, you can fan out the outer two rows or, or not, we'll leave it uh, uh, selected right now. Uh, we'll uh, include the escape routes. I will give preference to the differential pair. So and just say, okay. As you can see, it will it will automatically fan out the balls which has the uh, nets connected to them. So this is the auto fan out option that's available in the LTM. So now the next thing is uh, the tenting of wires. So so if you click on wire in the properties panel right right here on the right hand side, you can see there is solar mass expansion option. Click on the manual. Here there is tenting option available. So tending option, as we know, is basically covering the wire with the solder mask on external layers. Okay, if you don't want to be tented, then you can untick them. Uh, if you want to select all of them together, for example, selecting all the wires together, select one of the wire, right click on it and click on find similar. Then select the whole size of same <clears throat> and similarly paired size is same. And if you want, even you can uh, select the drill pair, which is top to bottom and say, okay. As you can see, all the wires of the similar whole size, pad size, and the drill pair will be selected. Then you can change it at once. So for example, eight minus, and uh, for example, tolerance of two plus, plus and tend them together. So this will be helpful while uh, <clears throat> doing the settings for all the wires together. Then uh, we move on to the uh, 0.4 mm pitch BGA. Here, as you can see, the pitch is 0.4 mm. So we'll what we'll do is uh, we'll set the grid to half of that, which is seven point eight seven four. As you can see, each ball is falling on each grid point. So here we cannot directly use a through wire, or maybe in a, a dog bone structure. As you can see, this is a Eight mil uh, whole size and eight mil pad. Even if I make this sixteen mil, uh, sorry, six mil, and this one to fourteen mil, still you can see it is overlapping all the, on all the three. Also, and the through wire will not go below six mil. So you have to uh, uh, fix it to six mil. Even if you make this twelve mil, if the if your manufacturer allows you with the three mil elder ring, still you can see it is overlapping and spacing is very less. Suppose I place it like this, instead of placing uh, as a dog bone structure, we, I place it on wire on pad. But here there will be issues because as you can see, if I keep placing these wires like this on all the pads in a line, the spacing, the spacing between uh, the two wires is only 3.748 mil, which will block the ground plane by entering into this, uh, uh, this thermal pad over here. So that is not recommended. So therefore, when it comes to 0.4 mm pitch VGA, using a through hole wire would be almost uh, next to impossible. So uh, it is it is uh, necessary that you use a, a blind wire, okay, with a size of four and ten. Similarly, over here, four and ten. So. So when it comes to 0.4 mm BGA, uh, using uh, making use of uh, through wires would be very difficult. So, uh, so keep that in mind. So then we move on to the uh, 0.5 mm pitch BGA. Here the pitch is uh, 0.5 mm, 19.6. We'll make the grid half of that, which is. is 9.8425. Now, uh, 
here the clearance between the adjacent pads you can see the diagonal is 17.839 mil so suppose i use a normal through wire Okay, suppose I uh, place a normal through wire over here. This is the uh, size of 6 mil and 14 mil uh, diameter. You can see the clearance on the adjacent sides, okay, on all the four sides is very less, which is not uh, possible, meaning uh, you won't be able to place a through wire in a dog bone structure over here. Therefore, it becomes necessary that you place it on the pad over here. But uh, as you can see on the outer two layers, outer two rows, they are directly fanned out. Uh, using the uh, traces which are going outside but suppose if i start placing this wire directly in this manner what will happen is that suppose this grounds were not present over here suppose this was some kind uh, different type of wires it will not allow the ground to enter inside the uh, bga because the clearance between adjacent wires would be only uh, 9.685 mil which would be very less it actually not 9.665. I'm I'm checking on the pad, which is should be checked on the wire. So it's only 5.685 mil. So which will not allow the ground to enter into the in uh, internal pads because uh, this through wires will be present on all the layers. So and it will block on all the layers. So it is very important to consider that you have to mention proper spacing between the wires when you use through wires on a 0.5 mm BGA. So that has to be uh, kept into mind if you are using if you are, if you want to use a through wire then uh, you need to be, maintain proper spacing so that your ground plane is not affected on internal layers then another uh, solution to this is that instead of using a through wire you can use a uh, <clears throat> blind wire because blind wire does not go through all the layers and a uh, so few internal layers will be uh, will be available for you to route the traces uh, on the internal layers so as you can see we have used uh, through a uh, blind wire over here which is going from layer 1 to 2 it has a size of 8 mil drill, uh, sorry, 8 mil uh, pad and 4 mil drill. So you can uh, make this uh, diameter 10 mil also uh, because we have kept it 2 mil uh, right now in learning, uh, but I would recommend keep it to 10 mil. So if I make this 10 mil, so it has a clearance of 3.92 mil, so which is uh, so which will be sufficient for you. Uh, going with the quarter arms uh, of uh, foil on the external layers. So uh, as you can, and also uh, dog bone structure is possible with the uh, uh, blind wire on the 0.5 mm pitch BG, as you can see over here. So this this is so this is helpful in uh, avoiding the uh, errors or the problem that will occur if you use a through wire on the 0.5 mm pitch BGA. So uh, keep that in mind uh, while uh, designing your next BGA uh, in future. So, and finally, uh, since we have placed few uh, wires on paired over here, as you can see, there are certain wires. So, and some, and we have also used blind wires over here. It, it becomes important to uh, add one more point in your fab details. So, as you can see, this 14 point, it states that blind wire and pad on wire should be filled with non conductive material. So, especially for the uh, wires on uh, uh, wire which are placed on pad, because uh, on the pads, there will be component uh, solder. So, it becomes important to uh, fill those wires because they can be before they can be plated because it can affect the solderability of the component also so do add this point if you have any uh, wires on pad or if you're using some blind wires in your design yeah thank you hope this will be useful for you uh, over to you sir i think that summarizes the the everything very good i, I don't really think i have any more uh, for the presentation um I mean, everything else is kind of like resources. Let me share my screen again. So for everyone who uh, comes to our webinars, thank you so much. 
Uh, we're giving another platform, which is our community platform, which Lucy talked about. So that's really for, for, you, for you guys, for designers in the designer community uh, to ask questions, be able to answer questions, showcase your knowledge and educate people who really are probably just starting out in the industry. And we created this webinar from the following blogs that we have. Uh, so we really pull a lot of the information from what we've already created. So if you want more in deep, a deeper dive, you can, you know, go to our blogs and read our blogs. And so these are the resources that we have. Again, uh, if there's any questions, you can continue the conversation on the community platform. And uh, we'll have our experts there standing by to uh, give answers. Uh, so, you know, feel free to reach out. That's why we're here. So I wanted to thank everyone again for joining and then also thank the design team and the manufacturer te manufacturing team for supporting uh, the questions, et cetera, and supporting our customers. Lucy, did you have anything to add? Uh, we have questions right now, so maybe can you check the Q&A and answer live? Sure, I'd be happy to do that. Uh, Randy asked, is there any advantage to filling some vias versus all vias? The answer is, no, once you go through the process, you go through the process and that's the cost. But if a via doesn't need to be filled, then don't fill it. So it's better, it's better to use it where it's needed and not use it where it's not needed, even though you're going through the whole process. And the reason for that is, you know, every via just could, you know, you have to look at every via, inspect every via. You could have, you know, problems one via at a time. So it's better to, to not do that. And then I've seen some defects, not manufacturing defects, but post manufacturing at the customer's end, people who filled everything, they run into thing issues that they didn't think that they would uh, run into. So I would recommend not to do that. Um, blind vias, something I've learned recently is uh, Sierra has created a process for like ultimate reliability blind vias, which actually includes mechanical drill uh, because the mechanical drills are just that good now, almost as accurate, if not as accurate as laser drills, both in true position as well as the depth of the drill. So blind vias typically can be, you know, we're done with lasers only, but now I see a Sierra doing it as a combination process just to get a more reliable uh, via structure. And maybe Steve Carney can address that a little bit more. Um, Jack asked, how does plate affect calculations? Plating definitely affects calculations. Plating varies across a panel. And um, cross-sectioning across the panel can help you understand what the variation is and how that would affect your models. I think those are some of the ones I can answer easily. And the other ones are really good questions that I cannot answer willy-nilly. I think it requires, honestly, a cross-functional review and then to give an answer. So in general, you know, how do you reduce your stubs? Well, use a blind, blind via or back drill out your mechanical via. But keep the questions coming because honestly, it improves our 
training, webinar, content, it improves everything. So questions are good. I okay, think that's two more questions. Uh, Steve, do you know the answers? How many ground via should surround a, sing a single signal via in a coaxial via structure for impedance matching? Uh, actually, I answered that uh, just now, but uh, I guess it's it's gone for some other question. Uh, normally, it depends on the uh, uh, the wavelength of the signal. Uh, so it's normally considered as lambda by ten or lambda by twenty spacing between each wire. So accordingly, you can decide the spacing, and depending on whatever is the length available and uh, within that space, how much you can uh, accommodate the uh, wires, you can add that much. But uh, you need to uh, you need to consider the internal layers also. So your wire shouldn't affect your planes on the internal layers. So keep that in mind uh, while adding the wires. Great. What about the two other questions? What's the best via to plane clearance? What's the minimum designers can get away with while maintaining good GFM? Uh, what's the best wire to plane clearance? Uh, wire to plane, I would say, uh, maintain 10 mils um, on the internal layers. Um, you can come down to 8 mils um, minimum if you want, but I would not recommend going below 8 mils. So I would say uh, keep it to 8 mils, but I would recommend go with 10 mils at least if possible. Uh, understand, but putting more wires means adding cost. So what would be the ops? Ground wire to surround one signal wire. Uh, there is not a specific. I cannot give you a specific number that. Uh, I would uh, take that. I would take that offline and and discuss with other and see if we can come up with some guidelines. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Two more questions. Is there any risk of having uh, an aspect ratio of ten by one on through drilled via? No, no risk at all. That's perfect. Okay, and recommended spacing for stitching vias? Uh, if it is on the board edge, I would recommend a spacing of 150 mils uh, between the wires. If it is on the board edge, and but if it is on the uh, if it is uh, covering a particular power section uh, to uh, to uh, dissipate the noise or mitigate the noise to ground, then it would be much smaller. Normally, it depends upon the lambda as a uh, wavelength. That is. Uh, normally it is either uh, 10, lambda by 10 or lambda by 20 spacing, yeah. Great, right, thank you very much. So we'll post these questions again uh, on the forum with the answers. I'll send you a link to that. And if you have more questions, just uh, ask on the thread and we'll reply. Thank you very much, Amit, Abhishek, Steve, everyone who did the demos. Uh, thank you everyone for attending and uh, have a great day.